You guys, we have two possible mic options. So if this doesn't sound good, um, we can try the other one. This one is preferred because then uh, Robert doesn't have to talk into this creepy mic that I have. <laughs> but um, it is really creepy. Yeah. Now I have to know why, why is it creepy? I'll take a picture and send it to you. Okay. <laughs> Let me just put it this way. It could have come out of an adult toy store. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my goodness. We, you don't have to speak into the creepy one then. Just All right, good. Hide that thing. <laughs> yeah. It's freaking me out. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. And I'm Jamie. And this is Clever. Today, we're talking to industrial designer Robert Brenner. He's a super interesting guy. You may be familiar with his name. You are definitely familiar with the products he's had a hand in designing. For example, Beats by Dre headphones... Raise your hand if you're listening to this on them right now. Not only are they the most popular headphones on the planet, they are a modern cultural icon. Robert's a co-founder of Ammunition Group, a San Francisco-based design studio that specializes in product design, brand identities, user experience, packaging, and service design. In recognition of their design-based contributions to society, Ammunition has been awarded the 2016 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Product Design, an award that acknowledges not just a single product, but a whole body of work and celebrates excellence, innovation, and the enhancement of quality of life. Prior to founding Ammunition, Bruner did a major stint as the director of industrial design at Apple, where he was instrumental in laying the groundwork for its current design-centric ethos. He's also co-authored a book titled, Do You Matter? How Great Design Will Make People Love Your Company, a design manifesto that makes a powerful argument for designing every aspect of the customer experience, not just the flashy end product. He's worked with such brands as Adobe, Williams Sonoma, and Dr. Dre. His works are in the permanent collections of several major museums, including the MoMA and Cooper Hewitt. Basically, he's got design cred across the board. Yeah, he does. (laughs) Let's talk to him. My name is Robert Bruner. I'm a resident of San Francisco, California, and I am an industrial designer because I don't know how to do anything else. (laughs) I don't know about that. You seem pretty multifaceted. I could bartend if I had to. Okay, so let's go all the way back to the beginning. We want to know about baby Robert Brenner. Can you tell us about your childhood? I learned that you're the son of an engineer and a painter. Is that correct? Almost. Yeah, my father was a very talented and successful mechanical engineer. He actually invented most of the mechanical technology and hard disk drives um, when he was at IBM. Yeah, I kind of grew up with these, well, they were giant. They were like these 12 inch platters, you know, that look like, you know, LP records. And uh, they were like all over our garage and our house, but he, yeah, he invented basically the mechanics that made those work of which some of that are actually in whatever hard disk drives that still exist today. Some of that of his um, inventions still, still exist in those products. So he was a mechanical engineer. My mom was a, um, she was an artist. She was a fine artist. She painted, um, did some sculpture. She was a um, chronic craftsperson. <laughs> Started her career actually as a, as a fashion model, and then eventually had a children's clothing business. So I, I kind of grew up in this environment where, you know, I had on one hand my dad, who was just, you know, he was just always making stuff. Anything was a project, right? Didn't matter if it was developing a disk drive or creating a shelf in the garage, everything, you know, had prototyping and, you know, play. <laughs> and then my mom was just always just doing stuff. I mean, I used to, we used to joke that there was no two consecutive Christmases that had the same theme, right? There were always something different, right? And, then, and um, I, you know, I wouldn't go as far to say it was like an, an Eamesian household, but, but not, not far off everything, like I said, it was a project. There was always creativity going on. It was just, you know, so it kind of made sense ending up doing what I was doing. But um, at the time, I just thought my parents were weird like every kid. You know. <laughs> I'm guessing you were involved in all of those projects. Did you have siblings? Was it always a family affair? Were you at your dad's side as he was engineering the shelves in the garage? So I was the youngest and we were all pretty far apart. I had a brother and a sister. I was the youngest and so I was always, always hanging out with my dad and he was always making me do stuff with him. You know, and I think it is interesting when you look back through the lens of where you are today. I remember I got really pissed off at him once because I had, um, I bought a new tire pump for my bike 
of which he decided one day to, to take over and, and duct tape it into a, a concept model he was making of a disk drive mechanism, right? That needed, <laughs> that needed a sliding component, right? And I was just like pissed out. I just bought that, right? And he's already hacked it up. Um, but, you know, I, that was the kind of thing that I was exposed to. And I didn't really understand it at the time. He was testing and playing with ideas and prototyping and so forth. But in retrospect, you know, it's kind of just you know, made sense ending up doing what I was doing. So it sounds like you grew up kind of just inherently learning the inner workings of everything, whether you wanted to or not. You know, I, I grew up a time without video games, without even a hell of a lot of TV. And so most of the time was spent in the garage, right, working on bikes and then later motorcycles. And then in high school, I got into electronics and always, you know, trying to blow something up in the garage was <laughs> primary pastime. And, and so, you know, but I think it was for me very important because I, I just really always enjoyed that idea of making something and building and finishing and seeing it work and or break or whatever. And uh, <laughs> Did you ever was, work on any projects with your dad where he kind of let you design it or take control of the project or anything like that? You know, I can't recall anything like that. <laughs> he was, you know, my dad. You were the helper. <laughs> yeah, I was the helper. You know, that's, you know, whether it was helping build something or clean the fish, right? That was you know, pretty much my role there. <laughs> okay. So in adolescence, you know, how is this manifesting? And, and, and personally, what kind of kid are you in high school? Did you play team sports? Were you on the debate team? <laughs> Pro, prom king, maybe? Science okay. fair winner? <laughs> I was in uh, swimming and water polo. So I did that all four years. You know, actually, I was going to try out for the football team my freshman year, but um, a very kind coach took me aside and told me that I had no um, athletic skill at all. So, uh, oh, oh but, man. You know, I, I had, well, when it came to like catching and throwing and blocking and so forth, but I had been um, swimming competitively for about four years and uh, I was going to do the swim team, but instead of um, football, I went out for water polo, which I later figured out it was a much more brutal sport than football anyway. I hear it's insanely brutal and you don't even see it because it's going on under the surface of the water. Yeah, it's probably one of the few sports where dirty play is, in fact, part of the game. And in fact, it's taught at all levels. So it was just, you know, wow. but, it, but it was great. It was it was really good. And it was something I was super competitive in. So it was great. Great to fall into that. Are there elements of, uh, I don't know, teamwork and collaboration that you feel like carried forward from that? You, you know, possibly. The main thing was a, a lot of discipline. I mean, really, you have to be in very good shape to compete in that sport. You know, m maybe more so of any, any sport, but it, it really is incredibly taxing physically. So the discipline of working out and, and it was important to me. I was on the um, homecoming court. Oh, I have to say uh, that. did manage to get to score that. But. A lady killer, huh? <laughs> well, you know, the way it works in high school, if during the actual homecoming game, I mean, there's two basic courts. There's one that the football players, but since they're playing in the game, they pick like other people not in football. So I got in the non-football version of that. So <laughs> Nice. So after high school, you went to San Jose State, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you started studying engineering, maybe following in your father's footsteps, but then you transitioned. So tell us about how that came about. It showed one of the problems with design, at least during that time, in that, you know, my um, high school counselor, you know, looked at, you know, when you have that sort of inevitable session before you graduate, and said, look, you're good in, in uh, math and science, um, you're an engineer, right? Didn't even look at it very well in art, and actually, I kicked ass in shop class, right? <laughs> so, but you know, that was sort of like you know, you follow a technical route. So I uh, originally decided I wanted to be a civil engineer because I thought that meant like building bridges and working on the Alaska pipeline or something like that. And then someone said, "No, that's you'll probably end up just designing like retaining walls for people." Um, so, and, and, and so I heard there was. Um, I actually then someone told me there was a lot of money in electrical engineering, and I thought, "Well, why don't I do that?" But I spent about a year in engineering school, and I did all right. But I just found it unfulfilling. And actually, in the beginning, it's not really fair because the first year of engineering school is pretty much core classes, but physics and chemistry and calculus and stuff like that. Which you know, my grades were okay, but I just was not connecting with it at all. 
And uh, I thought I'd rebel, right? And, and maybe I'll swing over to my mom's side, right? And decided to go over to the art department and thinking that, you know, that maybe I'll try sculpture. Maybe I'll, I, I knew what graphic design was and I thought that, that could be cool. But I, I, I always say this, I, I was very serendipitous that the, um, the door that I happened to walk into the art building as you walked in, there was this display case full of industrial design stuff, right? Renderings and models. And I just stopped there and looked at it and said, that's it. You know, that's, that's what I want to do because it had the, all the things that I'd like to do of drawing and illustrating and making things. And so I thought, well, this, this, this is perfect. So I changed my major. It didn't make my dad very happy. He referred to industrial designers as the guys who specified the paint. Oh, no. And, and he said, and it usually peels off, right? Was oh, funny. man. Industrial design had a real PR problem back then. It, it is true. It is true. And, and he, uh, it, he came around, but initially he was like, no, nah, you don't want to do that. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so then you graduated and prospered in the industrial design major, correct? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally loved it. I loved school, loved everything about um, the design curriculum, did very well in it. While I was in school, I started um, working at a design firm and started out in the model shop, like most everybody did, uh, which was a great experience. But uh, they were the kind of company, if they figured out you could do things, they were happy to put you to work. So here I was a student working on real projects, carrying a fair amount of responsibility. But and I always say that was like my, um, while I was still in school was sort of my master's degree because I got to learn how some things really happen and really kind of work with real projects with real clients and real engineers. And um, it, was super, it was super valuable to me. Even if I was only making like 10 bucks an hour, it was, you know, really, <laughs> really super valuable experience. And then you ended up consulting with Apple. How did that come about? Uh, my first job was this company called GVO. Okay. I met these two guys, Gerard Furbishaw and Jeff Smith. And uh, we, we did the classic, you know, after hours, we would go to have beers and plotted how we were going to leave and start our own company, and which we eventually did. First, we started this company called Interform. That, that only lasted a year or so. It just for a long story, just with the other individual involved, we kind of had a falling out. So we, we split off and started Lunar. And, uh, and that was really, really great. It was amazing. Um, I love those guys and still great friends with them. And, and we sort of built this product design consultancy from nothing into a, being a fairly um, highly regarded company. And, but I, had, um, I started working with Apple. It was sort of at the end of the period with Frog Design. Where they were um, very intertwined with Apple. Mm -hmm. And um, because they were still in a contract, they actually they didn't hire us to do industrial design work. They hired us to do engineering work, but it was really industrial design work. They just couldn't call it that. Uh -huh. And later I figured out it was a bit of a test, right, to see how we did. And it went, went very well. So we began shortly after that, after the, the frog contract ended, we began a series of projects with Apple. Work was really great. Projects were great, had a good relationship. I was approached by the gentleman who was in charge of product design to come and work for Apple as the design director. I at first said no because I just wanted to design stuff. I didn't really want to go and work in a corporation that was actually at that time sort of outsourcing most of the design work that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, What year was this? That would have been around, oh God, this is going to sound like a long time ago. It was <laughs> 19, would have been about 1989, 88, okay. 89. And um, so I said no, went back to doing what I was doing, and which was probably a really good thing because uh, about three months later, they came back and said, no, really, you're the person we want. What would you want to do the job? And I just said, well, I, I think, you know, Apple of any company should have an amazing world-class internal design organization. So if you asked me to do that and build that, that would be totally cool. So they Whoa. said, okay, they said, okay, why, let's do that. <laughs> it was really interesting. And it was like the first time in my life when I just, you know, whether they, I got the job or not, I, I didn't care that much. So I just said, well, that's what I would want. And they said, okay. And I said, learn this lesson. Well, yeah, you should ask for what you want because sometimes you might get it, right? So, um, yeah. 
So they, they agreed to do that, and I went you know, been on this process of building that team, recruiting, figuring out where it should sit in the company, driving the, the process structure, the work we were doing, all that. did that for about um, seven years or so, which was an amazing experience. And, yeah, and critical really. to the history of Apple. It was an important time in the company. It kind of gets overlooked because of... I always joke, right, that people ask me, you know, how I was working with Steve. And I always say, well, I was between jobs, right, because um, <laughs> he had left before I came. And, and, and the reason I was hired was actually to work with Jean-Louis Gasset, who was, you know, a very challenging, brilliant, but very en enigmatic individual and very emotional and then it sort of transitioned to Scully being my primary, John Scully being the primary person I worked with. And at the end, it was um, Michael Spindler. But then I left and about a year later, jobs came back. Right. So um, I say it was between jobs. It was an important time because, you know, we were building that internal ethos you know, and Johnny and Jana you know, joined the team and about a half dozen of the guys are still there. And so we really sort of began to form this idea of, you know, what that organization and team was about, you know, and, and it was interesting because everyone assumes that design at Apple has always been absolutely held in the highest regard. Well, that's, that's not true. I, because, because we were going through this period where the company was growing rapidly. A lot of people were coming in from different cultures, I think from, um, HP and Sun Microsystems and, you know, so they brought a different idea of how design should be treated. So it was actually a, quite a battle to continue to focus on, you know, an investment and importance of industrial design. So it was a really important period for the company and, and out of it, of course, came that group that has, has made so much happen, you know, since that time. Yeah, you sound sort of like the guy who made sure the soil was very fertile and tilled it and got everything ready. And then from that, so much could grow. Yeah, I wish I could see I foresaw all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just at that time, you know, trying to do a good job and trying to make something that, that would work really well for that company and do something with that brand and really own it. And, and I think that was the primary thing of sort of instilling this idea with the guys that, you know, we own this thing. Let's make it our. Right. So you spent seven years building this thing, making it your own. And then and then you moved on. Was that just you wanted to try something new or any regrets about that at all? Uh, no, I, I probably would have been fired if I'd stayed. So <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, really, because uh, I learned so much and I'm, I'm in a, a really great place. And, you know, I'm old enough now where I can look back at this lens and say, you know, as you these paths that you go through and I've had the benefit of being able to shift directions every so often, every seven years or so. And that period was fantastic. Made great relationships that still um, I hold close today. And it was a great um, boom for my career. In fact, I'm, I'm still uncomfortably, as it demonstrated here, still talking about Apple some <laughs> 20 odd years later. Well, we're all just so curious to know what it's like to have worked at Apple and be such a integral part of the industrial design division. It just seems like such an exciting opportunity that you know, you have had that not a lot of other people would have experienced in their lifetime. Yeah, the irony was, you know what, I remember saying when I decided to take the job, I think I said it to one of the guys at Linares, I felt I was young enough to make a mistake, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, it turned out not to be, but I thought, what the hell, you know, I'll do this if it blows up my face, I can do something else. But it was a fantastic experience. And, you know, the, a lot of the people I work with, and I still work with today, so it's, you know, it's no, no, no regrets at all. Fascinating. Okay, we'll be back in a minute with more Robert Brunner. Support for Clever comes from FreshBooks. As you know, our passion is telling stories about design and designers. We believe that the true purpose of design is to provide joy and better people's lives. The folks at FreshBooks happen to be on exactly the same page. FreshBooks makes beautifully designed, simple cloud accounting software that helps small business owners and freelance creatives save time and get paid faster. And it's actually pretty darn easy to use, so you can quickly get back to designing, creating, making, or whatever you do. Whether you need to create an invoice, which literally takes about 30 seconds, or log expenses on the go, we're pretty sure it'll make a big difference in your everyday business tasks. Plus, when using their newly designed mobile app, you'll be constantly reminded just how much design and usability matter to FreshBooks. 
to see how FreshBooks thoughtful, intuitive design can make a huge difference in how you deal with your day-to-day paperwork, go to freshbooks.com slash clever and enter clever or clever podcast in the, how did you hear about us section? So you have written a book or co-written a book called, do you matter? How great design will make people love your company. And you speak about this. Um, can you summarize the core message for our listeners? It's a pretty simple message. It's, it's really this notion that if you're an enterprise, a company, a service, whatever, that design really defines that relationship with your audience, right? The things that how you communicate, whether it's through your product, your service, your package, your retail, whatever, all those, you know, how, how you connect with people, it, design really defines that. So I always point out that design happens whether you're overt and strategic about it or not. I mean, you're making things, you're communicating the way things look, feel, how they sound, all, all that is design. It's, it's most important that you actually do it overtly, right? Instead of just letting, letting shit happen. <laughs> right. And design, the design of the things you create is that interface plane between you and your constituents or the outside world. And you, it takes on a different level of importance. And, you know, the notion of do you matter is is if if you're successful, right? If you're successful at it, you matter in people's lives. I I used to ask this question when I lecture to students sometimes where I'd say, um, you know, this was a few years ago. So how many of you people care if Dell goes out of business tomorrow? And, you know, usually no one would raise their hand, maybe one person. And then I'd say, how many of you care if Apple goes out of business tomorrow? And, of course, everyone would raise their hand. I'd say, well, why? Why do you care? You know, why does this brand matter in your life so much? And people would always talk about how the products made them feel. And, you know, they feel like they're a part of something bigger and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it's if you're successful, right, you will matter in people's lives. Well, and you've also said that uh, design is a process, not an event, right? Am I quoting you correctly? And explain what you mean by that, because I think it's it's a really powerful message. There's a lot of meanings in that, but the the main one is, you know, the design is not just a step in the process of making something. That's a very old school idea that, you know, for example, in product design, the design exists somewhere between marketing and engineering. Right. And so. Right. Engineer a a new gizmo and then design designs the black box that gets slapped on around it. Or marketing requirements come in and design concepts go out and then engineering, manufacturing, all that. That that is a very old school limiting view of design. Actually, design, instead of being that little vertical stripe, needs to be flipped over on its side. And it's really it's always a topic of conversation, no matter what part of that chain of events you're in, because ultimately, you know, what matters is the experience you deliver to people, mm-hmm. right? And everything that goes into that from the, 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 the idea, the technology, the development, the implementation, the delivery, the communication, all of that should be done under the threat of what is it that we want people to experience and how do we want them to feel and what do we want them to get out of it? That should be a thread and a conversation that goes through everywhere. That's what a a true design driven company does. And so it's a very simple idea, but unbelievably hard to build in a culture, but I think it's important. So that's what I was going to ask. Have you reached the crest yet where it's getting easier and easier to explain this concept and people are adopting it more, or is it still an uphill battle in terms of educating this idea and getting people on board? It's much easier today to get leaders of companies to understand that and, and believe in it. It is the idea of design to, because of companies like Apple and, and a few others being a, a, of a high strategic importance and value in companies. That, so it, it, people listen and they want that. Now actually doing it is another thing <laughs> that, that is, is much more difficult, but, but you, mm-hmm. people today, um, CEOs, leaders of companies will understand and listen. In fact, they want come and ask for that. Now, the challenge is actually to do that. It's not just a question of hiring some good designers and um, giving them a reasonable amount of money and say, go do that. It's, it really, it has to, again, work all through the corporation and through the culture. It really means changing the 
the values in the company and the things that are valued in, in people's efforts and what being successful means and all that. That is extremely hard stuff to do within an existing, well-established organization, but necessary and it takes time. It's one of the reasons we really do a lot of work with early stage companies because mm-hmm. you know, our ability to have that kind of impact is far, far greater. Mm-hmm. When it's a small number of people who are stakeholders who are starting something new and, and building a culture, and if they bought into it, it's much fewer obstacles to being being successful. Yeah, it. I was going to ask you if you had any experiences with a company that was fairly established where you were able to kind of come in and make them kind of come around to your way of thinking about design. One of the challenges with being in, in, the, in the role that, that I am in, in our company is that you know, you come in and you're, you're working on something very specific and that can be very successful. Getting that to spread out takes a lot of work and takes a lot of internal work to make that happen. In our history of ammunition, we've kind of fallen into this role of helping people create new things, right? And new businesses. And that's been both with startups, but also with established companies like Barnes and Noble and Adobe and William Sonoma and others where, you know, we've come in and helped them create something new and build out something new that they hadn't done before. And, uh, and that's something we're actually, it turns out that we're pretty good at. And we've been able to do that. But, you know, if you're going to go into a multi-billion dollar company and change their culture and, and how they look at design within that culture, it has to be supported at all levels, especially the upper levels, right? You're going to be able sure. to, because you, you, again, you need to get people to do things differently. And uh, that, that's a huge challenge. So Beats by Dre, you got in on that. That was very early stage, right? And that instigated a headphone renaissance, which I think we can all thank you for. Yeah. Um, prior to Beats by Dre, they're just these big black foam shackles, Um, (laughs) but, but can you tell us the story of how that got started and when you reached the tipping point and it was such a huge deal, it's kind of an exciting success story. I was involved very early when there wasn't anything and just really, um, Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre wanting to create audio products. And, and again, here I'm working with not a tech company with a music label essentially and, and helping them figure out how to do that. To be honest, in the beginning, it was just a really cool thing to be involved with. I, I really <laughs> did not have any idea it would be as successful as it was. And um, it was uh, it was very much about one product and making that one product happen and working with these guys to do that. After, after a while, we began to realize, wow, this thing is really going somewhere and really creating some cultural gravity. I give a lot of the credit, most of the credit on that to Jimmy, who's um, amazing at understanding how to connect with and communicate with an audience. And that was part of what he wanted to do was to use the, the experience and the relationships and the means that he had to build an audience in the same way he'd done that with artists over the years. And so that, that was, it was an, an incredible experience. And, and yes, when we first got involved, when I looked at it and looked at headphones, I realized that Rightfully so, but most headphones were driven almost entirely by function Mm -hmm. and, you know, how the acoustics, of course, and the ergonomics and comfort and durability and all very important things that are absolutely critical. But all those things yielded an aesthetic, which which wasn't really of the human body. right? (laughs) And I don't think it was any it wasn't a brilliant epiphany or anything, but really realizing these these are wearable technology, their, their fashion items or things people put on their bodies. They should look good when they're on and, and people should feel good about wearing them. And, you know, and so with the combination of looking through that lens at the design and then um, Jimmy's ability to make them culturally relevant, that's, you know, what really, you know, sort of was the, um, the catalyst, uh, the, the accelerant that made that thing become very powerful. Well, and also there wasn't an alternative to earbuds or earphones at the time other than the the big clunky black foam covered shackles. So um, a high quality headphone now became an option and worth carrying the extra baggage, right? If it sounded that much better. The brilliant business um, idea that Jimmy realized was that, you know, for a younger audience, there was no high performance audio brand. 
right? It just didn't exist. It, you know, Bose was your dad's headphone. Um, mm, mm -hmm. Sony wasn't what Sony used to be. Sennheiser was very esoteric. You know, there, there was this big gap, right? A big design gap. And that was the opportunity for, for the product to grow in that audience. And the interesting thing, after, I don't remember how long it was, it was after three or four years when things really started rolling, somebody did a study on the market and showed that actually Beats grew the market. It wasn't that they took market share away from Bose or anybody else. Those companies had still had sort of nominal growth. But what really happened was it brought an entire new audience to it and, and actually grew the market on its own, literally doubled it. And wow, it was you know, a testament to design, communication, you know, um, street marketing, all these things, you know, sort of making it making it all work. I mean, you talk a, a lot about the relationship between product and user and, and how we buy or use things or surround ourselves with things that we use to define who we are. Mm -hmm. And I never really thought of it before until more recently when I actually need headphones because I've started exploring music making and now sound quality and, and levels and all of those things are very important to me. But what I think I've really noticed beyond performance is that using a beautiful product on your body kind of reflects your personality and mm -hmm. it reflects that you really appreciate music. These objects really play such a large role in our society and in our culture. And it's really cool to watch something like that that's been around for so long just become completely redefined in a new way that feels really fresh and exciting. It's, it's a really challenging thing in design to do that. And we've had a lot of, in the last couple of years with the explosion of connected devices, you're sort of looking at all these things that, you know, you kind of figured they were done, right? That, you know, the toaster, toaster oven, right? Great. You could find a nice one if you look hard enough, but you know, but then all of a sudden we're looking through this lens of intelligence and connectivity and redefining these things and figuring out how to make them entirely different and better. And so it's, it's actually a challenging thing to figure out how you do that, how you take these well-established ideas of what things are and turn them on their side and break something new out of it. Yeah. And you've designed a lot of really popular products and done a lot of great projects. Are there any particular ones that you feel strongly connected to? Yeah, it's, it's usually, you know, relatively recent stuff but you know in beats of course I, I spent nine years and still working on it uh and and so of course that and those experiences that through that it was a, a strong connection for me an early project that i did was a personal computer called mindset and it ended up in the permanent collection of the museum of modern art in new york and and i was like all of like 24 years old right but it, but it was this product that I remember I was working for this company, GVO, at the time, and I just kind of, again, you know, I have this thing where I just dive into stuff and kind of oblivious, so I just kind of took over the project, and it, and it turned out amazingly well. And that was the thing that actually swung my dad over to say, oh, maybe it wasn't such a bad choice after all. <laughs> oh, that's the one that won your father's approval. <laughs> well, I, so it's a little family story. My, I, my father has since passed away and now so had... Um, an uncle on my mother's side who was very, very famous, a, a man named Herman Sheets, who um, worked on the original Nautilus submarine. And there's a wing at the, um, at the University of Rhode Island named after him, right? And um, anyway, long story short, my dad went to MoMA with, uh, with, with my uncle Herman to look at the product in the case. At the, at the museum and like my dad was so happy because uncle herman always treated him like a pedestrian engineer so <laughs> <laughs> made it all worthwhile um the other one is so this wait, not only got approval for you from your father but i got a approval for your father from your uncle yeah yeah that's, that's, oh that's nice yeah. that's nice that's like bowling a spare <laughs> <laughs> the other one was this little company i helped create called fuego which uh, makes sort of modernist barbecues but it was sort of the beginning of my quest to be more entrepreneurial in design. And it kind of led to the foundation of founding of Ammunition 2. I had this, um, which does, does qualify as an epiphany one day, that um, as designers, 
we, we treat our own intellectual property really cheaply, right? People come in and, and they hire you to a project and it's a cool project and you just want to work on it because it's cool and you can kind of do something really fun and interesting. And, and then you, you're paid enough to sort of, you know, that you can make a decent living and you pay your people and it's all good. And then you see this intellectual property that you've created go out and do enormously well, right? And my current business partner, Matt Rollinson, once said, you know, the, the irony is the, the moment that your work has its greatest value, right? When it goes out into the world, you're no longer associated with it. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you've moved on to something else and you're, you know, getting your whatever amount an hour you get. Right? And so that really made me want to do different business models, you know, partnerships, invest in some of the companies we work with, you know, just do different things. And, and Fuego was the first one where I had this idea and partnered up with an individual I worked with before and started this company and we actually pulled it off and manufactured and shipped the thing. With. You know, again, it was never a huge deal, but they were beautiful products. But that process of really owning and developing something, which really led to one of our core ideas here is that when we're really embedded in business with the people we're working with, we actually tend to be better designers. Mm. You know, we take the problem to heart more. We understand what's going on. We really push things to be successful. And we focus very much on the fact that it needs to get out in the world. It needs to happen. You know, and those are all important things about our company today that kind of came from that experience with Fuego. I love that philosophy because in your talks, you talk a lot about being emotionally invested in the things that you use or that surround you. But it's nice to hear that the designer or the design team also feels emotionally invested in that process and in that product or company. I think it translates. Yeah. Yeah. Ownership is a very powerful idea that intellectual emotional ownership is something when you care so much more about it, you put so much more into it, it, you, you end up doing much better work. Yeah. And speaking of better work, you won this year's 2016 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for product design. What Congratulations. an honor. Oh, thank yeah. you. Very exciting. So what does that really mean to you? I mean, words always mean something. And, and But, you know, we've either me individually or as a company have received a lot of awards over the years for individual products. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're always very excited. And when a prestigious organization like Cooper Hewitt looks at your body of work, and says this is important to be recognized and that you're, you're, you're doing things to further your profession and further humanity. It absolutely is super meaningful and it's really exciting. It's a great validation for our team here. And, and I mean, of course, I'm very proud, but I really enjoy how proud and excited the people that work here for us are about it. It's really been a, a fantastic honor. So let's talk a little bit about your creative process. I'm sure it's different for every brand because every product and every project is different, but is there something that you do every time or are there any rituals you have or uh, how do you get started? There's a couple answers to that. I mean, I, you know, we, as a team here, we have a, we have a process of in the beginning of always understanding context. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in empathy, right? That as a designer, you, you have to be empathetic. You have to be able to put yourself in someone else's place. You know, otherwise you're just designing stuff for yourself all the time, mm-hmm. which, you know, which can be successful. A lot of people have <laughs> done very well at that. But, you know, I've always felt this obligation to um, serve people in that way to really understand what their needs are, what's going on in their life and how this thing or artifact we're creating plays in that. So there's always a process of that. I've never been a big believer in research. You know, I actually always say that if great design was born in research, there'd be a lot more great design, <laughs> but it's because anybody can do research, right? What, what matters is what you do with the information for, for me, it's always in the beginning, having a context of what we're creating and who it's for and, what would make it matter in their lives and what problem are we really trying to solve all those questions, right? That's important for me personally, once we do that and sort of move into the actual creation of things and ideas, I've always found it really important to get everything in my head about the possibility of what this could be out. You know, some people will come up with three ideas and pick one and go with it. I've always been someone that needs to come up with dozens of things And what it is, is it's it's not so much, you know, come up with 25 ideas and let's pick one. It's really this process of 
understanding the problem and validating my gut feeling, right? Because I ended up coming back to one of the early notions of what I thought something should be. But ironically, I don't trust myself enough to just pick it then. I have to go through this process of looking at it more. <laughs> you know, it's basically what it is, is, is looking at the same thing in 25 different ways. You have to convince your gut that it was right in the first place. Yeah, but when, when you do that, when you, when you look at the same problem, you know, dozens of viewpoints, you begin to understand it better and then you begin to feel confident about the right viewpoint on it. And that, so that's always been an important part of, of how I like to work. So it would seem like to harness your empathy and your gut instinct. I mean, you talked a little bit about the intellectual process of sort of wiping the slate clean and then eventually circling back around to some of the things that were there already. But I'm wondering personally, is there anything you can do to strengthen your own self-awareness or your own empathy to make you a stronger designer? Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. Some, some people just aren't empathetic. You know, just, just, <laughs> yes, but, I know. Some, some are overly empathetic. They're called and, sociopaths. <laughs> yeah. But you, know, you said something earlier that, that's really a, a, a big belief of mine. Why I actually became fascinated with industrial design is that the things that we possess hold special places in our lives, the good ones. Right. And, and you do in many ways to some degree define yourself with the things you choose to surround yourself with mm-hmm. and because they hold meanings and again, they are self expressions of who you are. And, and that sort of idea of objects and tools, um, you know, holding this emotional place in people's lives has always been fascinating for me. And I said, you have to be able to put aside your world, right. And, and jump over and go to the table to this, other person's world and see through it. There's always this balance, right? Cause I, you know, I made the crack about some people just designing for themselves. Mm-hmm. You, I, I do believe though, you have to bring an editorial to stuff. You know, it's not just a matter of doing some ethnographic work and finding out what people like or what they need in their lives or the problem and then designing all around that criteria. And there you got it. You know, I've always felt it's very important as a studio to bring an editorial viewpoint on that and elevate the idea of what that thing is to a higher level of aesthetic and functionality and and understanding. So it's always this, this balance between being empathetic and understanding what you're trying to create and what it means to people, but then also bringing your own viewpoint into that, you know, not everyone has different viewpoints on that scale. But for me, having that balance is really important. And if you're good at it, you can actually do really amazing work. So I think that's kind of important about how we like to look at things here. Maybe not scientifically, but philosophically, do you believe that objects have a soul? Um, yeah, good ones do. No, I do. I think, again, it's back to the thing I was talking about, this sort of relationship people have with things. And, and I think what that really is, I think what's very important to people in general when it comes to products and and the things in their lives is, is that they can feel the hand and the mind of the person that created it, you know, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I think, and that that's kind of having soul, a soulless thing, you know, feels like it just got shot out of a factory. And, you know, it's, it, those are those things in your life that you either don't notice or only notice when they're bad. Right. Right. But the things you look at and you, and you marvel at the craftsmanship and you marvel at the way something was thought out or, you know, the, the way it sits and seems to have a life of its own, all those things um, overtly or not, you trace it back to, yes, yeah, somebody created that and created that experience for me. Isn't that really cool? You know, and mm-hmm. that, I think that's that's where it, I think when products have a soul. So we have talked to quite a few designers so far in doing this podcast and a lot of them, maybe even all of them we've talked to so far told us that they didn't even know that design was a profession or a field of study until they got to college or even after they went through studying something else. So how do you think we can bridge the gap between playing with Legos and getting to college? How do we get young kids aware and excited about design as, as a profession. And then it's a valid profession. It's, it's not just specking the paint. I agree. I mean, cause I, I mentioned before that was my existence. I, you know, until I walked into the art department, I didn't really know that this thing called industrial design existed. Right. You know, first of all, um, I, I put all my kids through private schools that had very strong arts programs and that's why, 
It wasn't so much that I felt like they needed to go to a private school. It just really it was important that the school have a good arts program. Anyway, one of their more enlightened instructors, when his teachers, when she understood what I did, she asked me to come to the class. I think it was seventh grade. And I just I brought a bunch of artifacts prototypes and products and models and I played some beats videos and you know but these kids were incredibly excited and and I could tell they were like wow somebody gets to do this for a living right they just mm-hmm. had never been exposed to that and you know in this school they were they were essentially using the design process as just a general problem solving tool which is you know design thinking, right? but they were teaching it to like sixth, seventh, eighth graders of really sort of thinking about how you work through a design problem. But, but, you know, what I walked away with was feeling like, well, you know, and then this is again, a, a private school in a fairly well-to-do community. I just, you know, the, what needs to happen is more exposure to the idea of a design profession at, at a younger age before high school, early in, in, in middle school. So kids begin to understand that there is this thing called design and there is a tool as a process and there are careers in that and there's these are the things you do and and it is i think just that exposure would do a lot to really help you know the next generation of designers move into our field i think if we still had shop class theoretically we could really make the connection between shop class and industrial design now i mean back in the day shop class was more about being handy around the house or maybe becoming a carpenter or a contractor but I just lament the disappearance of shop class and the arts. And I know that we're putting a lot of emphasis on STEM education, but I'm a big believer that STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math should actually be STEAM. And there's a movement um, called STEM to STEAM that includes the arts in that. And I wonder how you feel about that. No, I think it's, it's critical. And, and, you know, and when you do, you know, when you study a man like Steve Jobs, that's the one thing that stands out that he held the arts in as high regard or possibly higher than technology, right? Mm-hmm. Because it was understanding that relationship to humanity. And, and I had a, I have an interesting experience with one of my sons who recently transferred from a large university studying design to a, a private art school. And I think he thought maybe it might be easier going to a, a pure art school. And he's, you know, he's had to work like three times as much as he did. And, and I, I think there's a misconception about design and the arts in that it's all about the colorful aspects that we, you know, most people see when actually there's an incredible amount of process and discipline and understanding and research and technique and everything behind that's actually involved in creating something like that. You know, I, I do believe that that is, I said, that's why I've, I've put my kids to private school because I want to make sure they're exposed to that and understand that. And because I believe it will serve them throughout their lives, no matter what they do. Yes. So, yeah, no, I, I am absolutely in total agreement. You've had a lot of successes, both in, you know, designing products, great projects, your company has received a number of awards, but is there a personal way that you define success? That's a really good question. I guess I would define success by building things, right? And seeing them built and whether that's a product, whether that's a business, whether that's a home, you know, and it probably goes back to you know, talking about the child of my parents. I mean, that, that's what I saw is that's what they felt was success, right? Was actually making something and making it happen. And, and, and so I, I feel the same way that, you know, there's, a variety of ways to measure success in terms of recognition and notoriety or financial and so forth. But I guess for me, it's always just about being able to actually build something and build something of value. Mm. Um, that's the thing, you know, it's the thing why keep doing this. Cause there's, you know, every, every so often there's another opportunity to build something and create it and, and get it out into the world. And so I think that's, that's ultimately what drives me. So do you feel successful? You know, no, <laughs> yes and so, no. Okay. It, no, I mean, you, I mean, of course, you know, you, you realize you were able to accomplish some things, but I guess um, like anybody who's um, reasonably good at what they do, you never feel satisfied. So um, there's always more to be done. You've talked a lot about your work because we've asked you questions about your work, but now we want to ask you a little bit about 
yourself personally. Mm -hmm. Um, You create emotional experiences through the objects that you design for people. And we want to give an emotional experience to our listeners. So that means we have to splay you a little bit open and (laughs) ask you to tell us something that makes you human, uh, an embarrassing story or something that hints at your vulnerability. Oh, I don't know. Um, Let's see. I mean, you know, the whole Beats experience was really interesting to me because, you know, I am just your average design tech nerd guy, right? I am not, you know, and then you find yourself, you know, all of a sudden out of nowhere, hanging out with music industry superstars, right? You know, it's like self, how did I get here? But it was really weird because I actually had a very good relationship with both Jimmy and Dre And I always thought that was really odd, you know, but I finally realized after a while that they saw me as talent, right? Just like they put me in the same kind of bucket as, you know, Gwen Stefani or whatever, right? (laughs) It's just a talent, right? And they really respected talent. You know, my kids knew I was involved in this thing, but they didn't really believe me, you know, (laughs) and because, you know, what? I'm their embarrassing dad, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, all of a sudden I, I showed them this picture of me sandwiched between Dre and Diddy, right? And and everybody's smiling and we just look like the best of friends. And it just blew their minds, you know, just like they just like couldn't. It's like their whole world got flipped upside down and like, oh, my God, okay, there's there's my dad. It's weird, you know, so that's not really an embarrassing story. But it, it to me, that whole experience, while completely wild, I had no no right being in this situation at all. (laughs) I'm about as, you know, dorky as they come. I, I say about that picture, it's like I'm the, the dorky white filling in the hip sandwich. You know. <laughs> so what do you think really happened? Do you think your kids thought you were cool? Or do you think that uh, Dre and Diddy sort of lost a few notches of coolness by hanging out with you? Oh, probably both. But, um, <laughs> but you know, actually, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty cool dad. I mean, I, you know, the stuff I do and uh, I mean, you know, I'm. I won't tell you how old I am, but I still dress like I'm you know, 25. So they, I don't know. That's probably embarrassing to them, actually. You know, <laughs> that's the Bay Area way, my though. Dad, my dad has better skate shoes than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, of being father, how many kids do you have? Oh, this is going to blow your mind. I have six. Six what? kids? Yes, I have. Oh, six. my goodness. You okay. are prolific I on am, all fronts, I, sir. I am an anomaly in this world. Yes, I definitely And am. And how old? A daughter who's 29, who's getting married soon. Another daughter who's uh, 27. A son who's 21. A son who's 16. And then two three-year-old twins. <gasps> um, wow. Oh, yeah, my so. goodness. Were the three-year-old, was that a surprise that there were twins coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I was divorced and remarried, and we got married about uh, 10 years ago almost. And we wanted to have kids and um, yeah, just like, I'll never forget when we found out, we just, you know, sat there in silence for about 48 hours. <laughs> but, you know, now it's like you, you couldn't see it any other way, right? But at the, at the time, it was just like, oh my, what has happened here? That's crazy. <laughs> I can't imagine having two kids at once. You have your hands full with your job and all of your children. So fatherhood's obviously very important to mm-hmm. you. What kind of values are, are really important to you in terms of in, instilling in your kids? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, a lot of, you know, it's going to sound like usual stuff, but, you know, you try and teach them to be honest and teach them to be you know, good citizens and communicative and stuff. But, you know, the interesting thing I realized after going through it a number of times, you know, really th- this whole process of raising children is a 22 to 24 year long process of, of making them independent, right? From the very beginning to when you're finally shoving them out the door is, is always this process of helping them and teaching them to be well-functioning, independent human beings. And um, I think that's one of the gifts I like to give them is, is really helping them be that, be successful, independent, confident individuals. You know, they, they don't always, always agree with how that's being implemented right, right now. Right. Oh, it's their job to disagree at times. <laughs> exactly. You know, now it's like my two daughters who one of them actually works here at Ammunition, you know, seeing them be strong, successful, um, motivated people is about the best thing you could ever ask for. Right. So, yeah. Are any of the other older ones interested in design or the arts or? 
Yeah, my, I said my one 21 year old son is studying industrial design. Yes. Um, my 16 year old has a strong interest in photography. My uh, oldest is uh, in, in journalism, and Emily works here as a graphic designer. So, yeah, everybody, you know, pretty, they'll just form their own media company at some right. point. Right. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> it. They probably could, yeah. And my, my three year old daughter will probably run it because she's, you can tell she's that kind of person. She's going to take over. The and three year old daughter is little boss. You know, you can tell she's going to be running something, either yeah. a, a company or a country or something. I don't know. Yeah, I like mm-hmm. it. Okay, you're in the Bay Area. There's a lot of fun stuff happening in basketball. Are you a Warriors fan? I am a Warriors fan. I was, you know, it went dormant for a while because they sucked for so long. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> but I, I know I remember I was I'm old enough to win. I can remember when they won the championship back in the 70s. But no, it is amazing. Um, I actually, this is, I've been in heaven the last week, um, although my Sharks lost. But I'm a big hockey fan, too. So between the Warriors and the Sharks, I mean, my, my wife's kind of sick of me coming home every night early to plop my butt down in front of a game. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, but it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Well, what's, uh, on the big picture goal list for ammunition? You know, about 60 people, about 50 here in San Francisco and another 10 or 12 in New York. And when we started the company, this was kind of a point we said we, we didn't want to go past, right? Cause when you start as a design studio, when you start getting bigger, multiple offices, you know, the the founders of the company get further and further away from doing what they like to do. And uh, this is a good size for us because we can take on some very big complex things, but Matt and I can still be actively engaged in the process of actually doing it. So uh, as I mentioned, we work with a lot of early stage companies. We invest in them. We take equity in them. Some we actually really shepherd very closely and incubate. And, and I think that that's a big part of what we're doing going forward is, is moving further and further down that path of actually creating our own things and starting our own companies and, you know, just constantly building that portfolio because it, it's, it's really fun. <laughs> and as I said, your ability to drive something to the form that you had envisioned it is, is much stronger when you're, when you're in that type of game. So I think that is really the, the picture here, we work with, again, a variety of companies in different ways, but we're very focused on, on helping the creation of new things, whether that's a company or a business or a piece of technology. That's what we'd like to do. Well, what about new projects that you want our listeners to know about? Anything coming out? I get asked that a lot, and I would love to tell you about all the amazing things going on in the studio, but then I'd have to, yeah. have to kill you. Yeah. How about something that's already done that's recent? Well, you know, something we're really enjoying is this uh, work we're doing with Polaroid um, or with one of the licensees of the Polaroid brand in developing new photography stuff. So we did the little cube action camera. And then more recently, we've done a, a product called Snap, which is the sort of re-envisioning of the instant photography device, a printing camera. And we're on to the next round of things. So they have really allowed us to think about how to make Polaroid relevant again in people's lives because it is it is a brand that meant you know it meant a lot to me in an earlier time that they allowed just to degrade and you know be a brand slap on all kinds of stuff or so now at least in this area of of um, cameras we're we're getting to sort of help reestablish that and have meaning in a younger generations lives so that is really cool. And there'll be some new stuff coming from that pretty soon too. Oh, that's exciting. So where can our listeners, where's the best place for them to find out more about you on the web and social media? Ammunition group for both Twitter and Instagram. And of course our Facebook and then um, our website, ammunitiongroup.com. Also my, my personal Twitter is uh, is at RD Bruner. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for for sharing your time and your stories and philosophies with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. No, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. I almost wanted to like kick it and have a drink with him and and find out more about what I want to have a, converse- <laughs> have a drink with him and Dre and Diddy. <laughs> right. I was going to say, let's have a drink and find out like what those conversations were like. I know. I know. I would really love to be in like a brainstorming session. Yes. I'd love to see 
when he talks about like shoving all the preconceived notions out of his brain and mm-hmm. starting from scratch and then eventually they find their way back in, I would sometimes even just those preconceived notions are fascinating, right? Because we all have different ones. Um, yeah, I would love to just sort of crack open that skull and examine the contents. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, he's done so many really cool projects and has like this list of clients that just seems like every industrial designer's dream resume. Oh, and you know, I wanted to thank him for redesigning the lift mustache because that. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot about that. And I had written that down, too. That pink fuzzy mustache was nasty, gross. And it was like those eyelashes that they put on cars to make them look like they have eyes. It's just so it was like, uh, but he designed this new, like smaller neon Yes, the the hot pink glow stash, which is really elegant and a great way to identify a lift car without being... Oh, at night. Without being a disgusting, fuzzy, like, (laughs) linty gum stuck in it. I can't even imagine (laughs) what gets stuck or, like, to those things in New York City, like, after many, many miles of driving around. Okay, and this is an aside, but do you think when lift formed and made the mustache their logo their their identifying you know brand object that they were doing a play on mustache rides what's a mustache ride wait do i want to know sex thing. <laughs> sounds really gross <laughs> sex thing. okay i think i can visualize what yeah. it is so maybe we don't go there but i i don't think i don't know how could they not? oh that's pretty cheeky how could they not it's do you think that they thought they were going to be super popular to the point where they were like, guys, this pink furry mustache thing's not really working for us here? It'd be interesting to get Robert's take on this because maybe in the fact that it was so attention getting and so gross, it actually did work for them. And they always knew they'd eventually have to sub it out for something a little more practical. But maybe mm-hmm. it, it worked in the initial phase of really helping those cars be noticed and talked about. You know, and then by the yeah. time they they got all infested with rats and, and vermin, <laughs> it was time to swap them out anyway. Thanks to the hot pink glow stash, that is a problem that has been eradicated from our streets. <laughs> Thanks to Robert Brunner. I'm Thanks, so Robert. glad he chatted with us. I want to read the book, Do You Matter? I love the idea that he asks companies, do you think people would care if you went out of business tomorrow? Because that's a really important mindset to get yourself in, in terms of making products that are an actual contribution to society. I would buy or wear anything that he designs. I just feel like he's like Midas. (laughs) I I think that what he's really onto is that careful consideration of the relationship that's going to be on the other side, that empathy that he talks about. And He's he's acutely aware that if you have ownership on the side of birthing it, of bringing it to life, mm-hmm. then that passion is going to translate into the relationship that people have with it when ownership transfers over to that new person. I think he's very, very smart to pay such close attention to it and to really grow it, foster it within his company. Yeah. And what I really appreciate, too, is that he focuses a lot on emotional connection and relevance rather than status. Because, you know, you can think of of things in society that become status symbols versus just, you know, everybody adopting it. But he's kind of able to hit on that sweet spot where it's cool enough or well-designed enough to be popular, but doesn't really become something of superior status. It's accessible. They're inclusive. Yeah, I like it. I like him. (laughs) Now let's get a photo of him and uh, Dre and Diddy. (laughs) Oh, we got to get that photo for sure. Okay. Thanks for listening, guys. You can subscribe to Clever on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And would you do us a favor? Would you please leave us a review on iTunes? Not only does that really help us out, we totally value your feedback. You can also find us on the web at cleverpodcast.com, where you can read the show notes for this episode and sign up for our newsletter. Plus, hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We love hearing from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modell of Your Studio with music by L1011. 